Good afternoon across North America. I'm Kevin Hardy, Executive Director of the National Water Research Institute. It's my honor to welcome each of you to the 27th Annual Joan Irvine Smith and Athlete R. Irvine Clark Prize. Like so many other traditions, this year's virtual event is a first for the Clark Prize. Our program will, of course, feature the Clark Prize lecture, Water Treatment at the Speed of UV Light. And to celebrate the impact of the Clark Prize, we're also excited to share videos highlighting some of the innovative work being done today at the NWRI member agencies. We're excited to share this 27th annual program with you. And as I prepared for this year's event, I spent a few moments with pictures, black pictures and white pictures and slides and digitals. And after spending some time with these historic photos from the first 26 Clark Prize Award ceremonies, even a casual observer notices the smiles of joy and engaging together in common interest. You see colleagues, friends and family, and everyone smiling. Right now, I miss your smiles. I look forward to the day that we can celebrate the Clark Prize Award Ceremony together, bound for those few moments by our shared mutual curiosity about water resources science, technology, and policy. And today, we're also bound by loss. And the loss of human life is certainly foremost, and many of you have also lost jobs or endured other economic hardships. And we're bound by the loss of this meeting family traditions and the rise of pod weddings and virtual commencements and other proxies. But this loss informs our resilience, that quality of character that enables us to recalibrate our expectations and behaviors in an effort to adapt to changes in our daily routines and ways of life. It is this spirit of human resilience that will enable each of us to navigate these times as individuals, to continue to support the communities to which we belong, and to help drive our institution in service to others. And it is with this spirit of human resilience that we will enable to find our new and hopefully better normal that will drive our solutions to challenges upon which I will rely to help me look forward to seeing each of you and your smiling faces at the Clark Prize Award Ceremony in 2021. Welcome to the 2020 Clark Prize Award Ceremony. I'm Jim Herberg, General Manager of Orange County Sanitation District. OCSD provides regional wastewater service to 2.6 million customers in central and northern Orange County, and we're a proud member of NWRI. We're excited for the opportunity to greet you all today and celebrate your accomplishments. As part of our partnership with the Orange County Water District, we're currently working on the final expansion of the groundwater replenishment system. In 2023, when the expansion is complete, GWRS will provide a reliable water source for up to 1 million people. And NWRI's expert independent advisory panel continues to ensure that the program will provide safe, high quality water that's worthy of the public's trust. When OCSD was weighing the merits of ceasing our chlorine disinfection a few years back, NWRI again provided us with a panel of internationally recognized experts to help guide us through this important decision. Our leading edge recycling efforts would not have been made possible without credibility and public support. We've been helped in our industry leading program by the credible independent scientific review provided by talented people like yourselves. OCSD is proud to support NWRI and on behalf of our board of directors, our staff and the citizens we serve, Congratulations to the 27th Clark Prize Laureate. Reflecting on 2020, the National Water Research Institute is grateful for the unyielding support of our founding member agencies that have sustained the Institute into its third full decade. These agencies, Inland Empire Utilities Agency, Irvine Ranch Water District, the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power, Orange County Sanitation District, Orange County Water District, and West Basin Municipal Water District founded NWRI in 1991 to establish an organization that would enable regional water research initiatives aimed specifically at developing new water sources, conserving water, improving water quality, and promoting efficient water use on a regional, statewide, and national basis. Joining these forward-thinking public utilities was a visionary philanthropic partner, the Joan Irvine Smith and Athlete R. Irvine Clark Foundation. Together, the NWRI member agencies and foundation have funded over $30 million in collaborative research that now supports much of the scientific, technical, and policy framework for advanced water purification here in Orange County, here in California, and around the globe. Our reputation for practical research that helps communities create new sources of water is international. Our experts hail from North America, Europe, Australia, and Asia. And today I'm pleased to report that the sun never sets on NWRI's work around the world. And our work's never been more critical. More than ever, we understand that public health and the economy are inextricably intertwined with healthy, abundant, and resilient water supplies. 
We're grateful for the opportunity to have a role in this important work, and we're grateful for the support of our founders. Please join me in recognizing the NWRI Board of Directors for their enduring leadership and support of NWRI and the Clark Prize for outstanding achievement in water science and technology. Chair Jim Ferriman, representing the Orange County Sanitation District. Vice Chair John Withers, representing the Irvine Ranch Water District. Director Steve Eli, representing the Inland Empire Utilities Agency. Director Razmik Manukian, representing the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. Director Kathy Green, representing the Orange County Water District. And Director Harold Williams, representing the West Basin Municipal Water District. I also rely on the support of the Board of Directors Officers, Secretary Mike Marcus and Treasurer Jason Datticus. I've asked much of this board over the past year, and we rely on their guidance. Thank you to each of you. But each member of our board of directors is deeply involved in their respective communities, and they're a respected leader in the broader water community as well. This means that they're in demand, that their time is at a premium, and sometimes there are competing priorities. In recognition of this practical reality, each of the NWRI member agencies also appoints an alternate director to our board. Alternate directors are essential to the board's experience, wisdom and continuity, and they help ensure that our research, outreach, and administrative work continuously improve. I want to express our gratitude to alternate directors Randy Lee from IEUA, Doug Reinhardt from IRWD, Jim Herberg from OCSD, Paul Liu from LADWP, Jordan Brandman from OCWD, and Barkev Messerlian from West Basin. The Joan Irvine Smith and Athlete R. Irvine Clark Foundation made an unprecedented commitment to NWRI in 1991. The Foundation's unwavering support of NWRI and the Clark Prize represents a unique philanthropic commitment to the advancement of water resources science and management. Please join me in thanking Mr. James Irvine Swindon for his leadership at the Foundation, his support of NWRI in general, and specifically for his contributions to my learning, the Clark Prize Executive Committee, and for his financial support of the Clark Prize Cash Award. Jim, thank you for your gracious and steadfast support. And no recognition of NWRI's supporters will be complete without taking a moment to reflect on the contributions of NWRI's incredible staff. This group stepped up in a very profound way for me in 2020, and I want to personally thank research scientist and project manager Suzanne Sharkey, technical editor Mary Collins, accountant Julie Absher, and our new graduate student intern Natalie Roberts. Thank you, NWRI member agencies. Thank you to the Joan Irvine Smith and Athlete R. Irvine Clark Foundation. Thank you to our experts, especially our panel chairs, and thank you to the NWRI staff. Good evening, and welcome to the 2020 Clark Prize Award Ceremony. I'm Steve Eli, elected director on the board of the Inland Empire Utilities Agency, or IEUA. I am IEUA's representative and a longtime supporter of MWRI. We're honored to co-host this prestigious event, which aims to recognize those who show tremendous dedication to innovation, water science, and technology. To accompany this theme, we are proud to showcase some of our own innovative projects and initiatives. The Inland Empire Utilities Agency is proud to support the National Water Research Institute and on behalf of our board of directors and our entire staff, we'd like to congratulate the 27th Clark Prize Laureate. Congratulations. In our last Clark Prize lecture, Laureate Paul Westerhoff admonished us to work more diligently at foreseeing and thoughtfully addressing the myriad challenges of consistently producing safe, healthy and abundant water supplies in the 21st century. Water supply challenges that impact every community in every country on every inhabited continent. As Paul spoke to us late last October, what was indeed imminently foreseeable, a global pandemic caused by a novel coronavirus, was hidden in plain sight right before our eyes. I'm pleased to report that despite this scurrilous pandemic, the Institute is stronger today than at any time in my nearly four years as its executive director. First, our staff is competent and capable. 
This year we will continue to design and integrate best practices for remote meeting facilitation into our expert panels as we continue to adapt, improvise and overcome business challenges caused by COVID-19. We've implemented initiatives to better understand our revenues and expenses and develop tools that track project financial performances. These initiatives form a solid foundation for NWRI's long-term success. Second, we need to be at our best because our project portfolio is expanding. We will continue legacy independent panels here in California, including IAPs that serve the Santa Ana River Monitoring Program, the Orange County Groundwater Replenishment System, Pure Water San Diego, the Valley Water Regional Potable Reuse Program, and the East County Advanced Water Purification Facility. In addition, we've recently begun several new independent advisory engagements in the Los Angeles region. The Los Angeles Bureau of Sanitation and its water recycling partners, the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power and West Basin Municipal Water District have engaged NWRI to support their joint Hyperion membrane bioreactor project. A separate a complementary project sponsored by the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California and its partner, the County Sanitation Districts of Los Angeles County, have also engaged NWI to review their Advanced Water Purification Center demonstration. We are also engaged in ongoing work around the country as well, including critical regional water supply projects serving the Lot Alliance in Olympia, Washington, and the Sustainable Water Initiative for Tomorrow in Hampton Roads, Virginia. We will undertake new international engagements with the Japanese Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry, and MECRO, the Israeli National Water Company. We will initiate new high-profile work to support the development of California regulations that govern both on-site non-potable water reuse and direct potable reuse. And we will kick off new projects to help the communities of Roseville, California, and Anne Arundel County, Maryland. But not only is the scope and diversity of our client community expanding, NWRI has more experts actively engaged in independent advisory projects now than at any time in our history. Many of the best and brightest people are making their way into the water community, and NWR experts like Clark Prize laureates are uncommon persons. Identifying and recruiting young researchers remains one of my top priorities. And finally, we can thank COVID-19 for making public health a higher priority than it was just a few months ago. COVID has raised awareness about public health risks and concerns, and local action aimed at independently vetting those concerns is a critical tool for agencies seeking to undertake water recycling projects. NWRI panels provide credible scientific, technical, and policy review on a community-specific basis that drives value across a project's life cycle. And indeed, the Institute is strong because our work strives to meet Dr. Westerhoff's challenge to diligently foresee and thoughtfully address the myriad challenges of consistently producing safe, healthy, and abundant water supplies in the 21st century. On behalf of the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power, we want to thank the NWRI for having us as part of the Clark Prize and showcasing our Operation Next project. Operation Next is about sourcing our water locally into the future, and here it is. Water has played a large part of LA's rich history. It was the availability of water from the LA River and later the LA Aqueduct that made our city the large bustling metropolis that it is today. Much of the water in Los Angeles comes from distant sources. However, the supplies are increasingly limited and subject to disruptions like prolonged droughts, earthquakes, and other natural disasters. As our city continues to grow and our need for water increases, we need to ensure our water supply stays reliable, resilient, and sustainable for generations to come. We are ready for the next step to keep our city water strong. Operation Next. And that is securing more local water supplies, including recycling 100% of LA's wastewater by 2035. Operation Next will be a huge transformation of LA's water system and will increase LA's local water supply to 70% of all water served in the city. This monumental effort will require a lot of planning and coordination, engineering, and public engagement to succeed. Our plan is to first build advanced treatment facilities at the city's Hyperion Water Reclamation Plant in Playa del Rey. And then we will build pipes, pumps, and structures to move the water to the Central, West Coast, and San Fernando groundwater basins. When regulations permit, we will also move the water directly to our drinking water treatment facilities to augment our water supplies. In keeping with our commitment to serve only the highest quality water, we will treat all this water to meet state and federal drinking water standards before serving to our customers. 
Operation Next is a regional collaboration led by the LADWP in partnership with Los Angeles Sanitation and Environment, which operates and maintains the city's wastewater treatment facilities. LADWP is working to reduce our dependence on imported purchased water using more local water supplies because in order to sustain our city, we must remain water strong. To learn more, visit us at LADWP.com. Good afternoon. My name is Patrick Shields, General Manager of the West Basin Municipal Water District. On behalf of everyone at West Basin, I am very excited to join our colleagues today in welcoming you to the 2020 Clark Prize Award Ceremony. For the past 25 years, West Basin has built a world-class recycled water program based on scientifically proven technologies and an advanced, highly integrated system of treatment facilities. From local projects that serve recycled water, to neighborhood schools and parks, to major undertakings such as the district's recent SoFi Stadium and Hollywood Park Recycled Water Connection, West Basin is committed to meeting the current and future water needs of our highly diverse region. Now, I invite you to watch the following video highlight of the West Basin Recycled Water Program. We receive between 35 and 45 million gallons a day from my period. There's a side stream that comes back through a pipeline and gets here on the northeast side of our plant and then it splits in two and goes through our process. We make five designer waters. If we don't have a customer with a particular specification for that water, we don't make it. We have everything from what's used for irrigation, like everything from parks, high schools, medians. We have very large refineries here, some of the multinationals. Uh, that use a lot of water, which they normally would be using drinking water. We were able to replace that with recycled water. That requires going through the reverse osmosis drains once, then a second time. It's super high quality water. And our very largest customer is seawater intrusion barrier water, what we call barrier water, that essentially meets all drinking water standards. The county has several wells along the west coast that are used to inject water underground to protect the local aquifer from seawater intrusion. Right now we're injecting about 14 or 15 million gallons a day in that barrier project and eventually it's going to make it to the aquifer. It requires an additional step of uh, treatment and disinfection and it becomes, technically speaking, water that everybody can use. We have a fully ELAP certified laboratory. We do 25, 30,000 tests a year. You can walk into the facility and actually see the technology, the latest and the greatest that make those five designer waters. We have the control room that monitors the entire recycled water system. We have well over 100 miles of dedicated purple pipe to get our recycled water out in our service area. The benefit to the community is it's extraordinary. It's a local water supply and it gives a, a water supply security that you otherwise wouldn't have. Thank you, Kevin. As chair of the Clark Price Selection Committee, it is a pleasure and honor to talk about the selection committee, the selection criteria, and the winning candidate. The selection committee members represent diverse backgrounds and come from all parts of the country. For my part, it has been a wonderful experience to work with them on the Clark Prize. 
When we think about the Clark Prize, it is important to recognize that the Clark Prize is unique in that the laureate must excel in each of the following four areas, which are weighted equally, and that's very important. Research accomplishments, current research or policy endeavors, public outreach and advocacy, and leadership in water issues. After evaluating the scores and qualifications of the 2020 nominees, the committee was pleased to unanimously select Professor Carl G. Linden as the 2020 Clark Prize Laureate. Timeline for Carl. Education, 1989 BS degree from Cornell University, 1993 MS from the University of California, Davis, 1997 PhD, University of California, Davis. In the early 1990s, I had the pleasure of employing Carl as a research associate on one of my projects. With respect to academic career, Carl started his university career at the University of North Carolina. He then moved to Duke University, and finally in 2008, moved to the University of Colorado, where he is presently located. If we consider some career highlights, Carl's career can be characterized by his sustained contributions to the development of UV-based research, including the development of new innovative treatment processes as well as standards of practice. Another hallmark of his research is that it has always involved outreach to industry, consultants, utilities, and regulatory agencies. His leadership in water issues includes service as president of the Association of Environmental Engineering and Science Professors and the International UV Association. Carl's current research interests, again designed to protect public health, are focused in three general areas. One, use of light emitting diodes in a variety of innovative disinfection applications, which is an extension really of his earlier work, but with later technology. Two, the use of UV for distributed small systems. And three, advancing water and sanitation for developing countries. In all of these areas, there is a fundamental research component, a public service component, and a leadership component. Congratulations, Carl. On behalf of the Clark Prize Selection Committee, it is an honor to welcome you as the 2020 Clark Prize Laureate. There's no length. Or height. Or depth. That we won't go to get the right sample. We rise early. And climb high. We're the Irvine Ranch Water District. And we welcome you to the 2020 Clark Prize Ceremony. Each year, we report more than 100,000 analytical results, screening your water for microbiological, organic chemical, inorganic chemical, and physical parameters. At our state-certified laboratory, we use advanced technologies to gather these results. We analyze for over 100 organic compounds, including both semi-volatiles, like pesticides, and volatiles, like solvents. Using advanced technology, we're able to see down to less than one part per billion, which is like one drop in an Olympic-sized swimming pool. We analyze physical parameters, such as color, odor, and turbidity, or the clarity of water, and inorganic parameters, such as salts, metals, and minerals. State-of-the-art instrumentation is used in the laboratory. Iron chromatography is used to analyze for salts and minerals, and inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry is used to analyze for metals. So what does this all mean? Our drinking water is now ready for distribution throughout Irvine Ranch Water District service territory. Ready for your water glass, or sippy cup, or pasta pot, or shower. And with this commitment to water science, technology, and quality, Irvine Ranch Water District is proud to support the National Water Research Institute. On behalf of the Irvine Ranch Water District, Board of Directors and staff, we congratulate the 27th Clark Prize Laureate. I'm joined now by James Irvine Swindon. 
Vice President of the Joan Irvine Smith and Athlete R. Irvine Clark Foundation, NWRI's longtime philanthropic partner and sponsor of the Clark Prize for Excellence in Water Research and Science. Jim, as I've come to understand, the Clark Prize and NWRI are just part of a compelling intergenerational story about water. Your family came to what is now known as Orange County in Southern California over 150 years ago. Can you share a bit of the family history and give our audience some insight about the challenges they faced and overcame and how this loss and resilience contributed both to the formation of NWRI and the establishment of the Clark Prize? Thank you, Kevin. Um, it's my pleasure to be here today and participate in the celebration of the 2020 Clark um, Richardson Irvine Clark Prize. And uh, this prize was established by my mother in memory of our grandmother, Athlete Clark, for her contribution not only to Orange County, but also to the state and to the nation. Our grandmother was very much ahead of her time, and most of the time she did it on her own. She was a philanthropist, she dabbled in politics, she was a astute businesswoman, and she also was a farmer and a rancher. During her life, she owned over five different ranches and farms in, that spread across the country from Virginia to Hawaii and, of course, in California. Her property in Visalia actually was across the street from the work camp that John Steinbeck made famous in his novel, The Grapes of Wrath. And his property in, in the San Fernando Valley, which my great-grandfather told her she made a horrible mistake when she bought, ended up being the cornerstone of the Northridge shopping mall when she sold it. So she was way ahead of her time, and given that she had lost both her husbands during a lifetime, um, she was very much on her own. But the real story begins 150 years earlier when James Irvine purchased the three Mexican land grants in 1863. And when everybody says timing is critical, think that in 1863, he bought that property at the beginning of California's second major drought during the 1800s. Later, in the early 1900s, when his son James Irvine took over the operations, he de decided to diversify from ranching, meaning cattle and sheep, into agriculture. From the 1900s to the 1950s, with the help of his son, James Irvine III, he transformed the Irvine Ranch into one of the largest agricultural concerns in the United States. At its height, there were over 50,000 acres under agriculture, and that demands a lot of water. Over 1,000 wells were drilled, and the Irvine Lake was built as a reservoir. But he also did this during two world wars, the major um, depression, and at that time, between 1900 and 1950, California suffered four major droughts, the longest of which lasted nine years. My mother then took up the mantle, and in the 1970s, she was a major proponent for the Dwyer well field, which is now a cornerstone of the underground system that the Irvine Ranch Water District uses, which provides over close to 50% of the water needs of its members. Eventually, she decided that she wanted to establish an institute that would actually go forward and advance water research, and most importantly, advanced collaboration between scientists and users and producers. And this was her dream, and it accumulated in the formation of the National Water Research Institute. So Kevin, on behalf of our foundation, I want to thank the staff, the administrators, the employees, the directors of the National Water Research Institute and all the member agencies for all the incredible work that they do in order to create and preserve and protect this natural resource that is most vital to our existence. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Orange County Water District has valued its collaboration with the National Water Research Institute since its inception, and we're honored to be a part of the Clark Prize Awards ceremony. As a leader in groundwater management and water reuse, We've relied on NWRI independent advisory panels to provide recommendations that have helped guide our monitoring programs and have helped to foster public support and enhance credibility for projects like our world-renowned groundwater replenishment system, what we refer to as the GWRS. We're proud of the great work that we've accomplished together 
to promote support for and awareness of water reuse throughout the world. Your contributions to this important effort are appreciated. Today, we would like to extend our congratulations to the 27th Clark Prize Laureate. Thank you for your great work and we look forward to our continued effort to advance research and projects in the water industry. While it was impossible to bring the 27th laureate to NWRI to give his lecture, we were able to bring the NWRI community to Boulder to welcome Dr. Linden to the ranks of Clark Prize laureates. Joanne Silverstein served on the NWRI Research Advisory Board in the 1990s. The RAB helped allocate funding of direct research that helped move the science and technology of water reuse forward. Joanne Silverstein is a professor in the Department of Civil, Environmental, and Architectural Engineering at the University of Colorado Boulder and a former director of the program in environmental design. Her research and teaching is focused on the application of microbial processes to remove contaminants from water and wastewater, treat wastewater for beneficial reuse, and restore damaged environmental sites. Joanne? It is a great pleasure for me to introduce Professor Carl Linden, the recipient of the 2020 Athelie Richardson Irvine Clark Prize for Outstanding Achievement in Water Science and Technology, presented by the National Water Research Institute. It is a special pleasure for me because Carl is a valued colleague of mine at the University of Colorado Boulder, where he is the Mortensen Professor of Sustainable Development and also a fellow University of California Davis alum. Carl and I both have connections with the National Water Research Institute. I served on the Research Advisory Board from 1995 to 2009, and Carl was an invited participant in the NWRI UV 2000 Symposium and contributed to the 2003 NWRI guidance document for disinfection for water reuse um, that came out of that symposium. Three of Carl's students have also received the NWRI doctoral fellowship. Carl is an internationally recognized leader in the field of UV disinfection and photooxidation processes. In addition to important fundamental contributions to disinfection theory, including the science of photoinactivation of viruses and other pathogens. Carl has pioneered the application of UV technology in drinking water, wastewater, and reclaimed water treatment, including new research in UV LEDs. He has served as technical advisor to a number of public agencies, including the New York City Department of Environmental Protection, the Orange County Water District Technical Review Committee for the Groundwater Replenishment Project, and the National Water Advisory Council of the US EPA. In 2011, Carl was elected a trustee of the American Water Works Association Water Science and Research Division, and he is currently working with the World Health Organization in helping to develop guidelines for drinking water quality with an emphasis on pathogen reduction in small community systems. Carl's activities in environmental and water-related professional societies has been similarly extensive he has been a board member and president of the Association of Environmental Engineering and Science Professors, and he is also a founding board member of the International UV Association. His research and professional development have garnered numerous awards from AEESP, the Water Reuse Foundation, the Water Environment Federation, and the Water Research Foundation. One of the programs that attracted Carl to CU Boulder in 2008 was the Mortensen Center in Engineering for Developing Communities. And he has since had an enormous impact on the success of that program as co-director for research and graduate studies. And he's currently an associate director. He has led the development of new research in water and sanitation in developing communities at the Mortensen Center as principal investigator on a National Science Foundation funded project for student education in Peru, a $2.5 million grant from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for reinventing the toilet, and a $15.3 million learning partnership to promote sustainable water and sanitation programs in East Africa. Carl introduced new graduate curriculum and undergraduate curriculum in water and sanitation in that program, 
and he has also been faculty advisor to the CU Engineers Without Borders chapter. In addition to technical and development impact, Carl's work with the Mortensen Center has launched many graduates into careers in international development in agencies such as the Millennium Challenge Corporation, Bridges to Prosperity, Oxfam Great Britain, and Cantaro Azul in Mexico, Partners in Development in South Africa, and a small community organization in the Central Valley of California. The Clark Prize's inspiring recognition of the amazing range of Carl Linden's contributions to groundbreaking research on photon-based processes in water, to innovative applications in the disinfection of water supplies, to informed guidance for utilities, regulators, and water professionals, and to mentoring new generations of students who as practicing engineers and scientists will expand the access of global developing communities to safe water supplies. Carl will be talking today on water treatment at the speed of UV light. I want to prefer my most sincere congratulations for this much deserved honor, the Clark Prize. On behalf of the Joan Irvine Smith and our Athlete R. Clark Foundation and the National Water Research Institute, it is my great pleasure this year to bestow upon Dr. Carl Linden the 2020 Athlete R. Clark Irvine Prize. Thank you, Kevin and Jim, and certainly thank you, Joanne. It's great to have you here in Colorado. Um, I want to thank the 26th Clark Prize Laureate Paul Westerhoff for nominating me and pulling my nomination package together. I wish to thank the Clark Prize Committee for selecting me as the 27th Laureate. And thank you, George T., of course. It's so wonderful to share this program with you and to uh, get to know you in so many ways over the years. This year, 2020, it's been a difficult and challenging year for all of us. I'm here standing in a beautiful lecture room alone in a tuxedo with a view of Boulder and the Rocky Mountains behind me. You're all watching this from the program from your homes, from your places of work. We're all adhering to strict COVID-19 protocols because we care about each other and we want to minimize the loss, the human loss many of us have suffered. My heart goes out to those of you who have suffered loss due to the COVID-19 pandemic and have been affected by this pandemic in so many ways. My talk today is really a story about people. It's about community. It's about our water community, and that community is strong. Our environmental science and engineering community is strong as well. We are fully participating and innovating in the fight to combat this COVID-19 crisis. We're coming up with creative ways to maintain connections and to teach our students. We will come out of this stronger and more resilient. The story I want to share with you today is about people. It's about relationships. It's about community. It's about mentoring. It's about being uh, mentored and supported. I'm really excited to take you on a bit of a journey through the path that helped shape my career. It starts with stories of people, of course. So my talk is titled, Water Treatment at the Speed of UV Light. But it's really a story about these people, and the students I've got to work with. Without these people, the students and postdocs I've gotten to work with over my career, I would not be standing here as the Clark Prize Laureate. For my very first student, I've been fortunate to have worked with talented, smart, creative, and tenacious students. Their faces are on your screens, they're scattered across the globe, working on problems that we all care about. They're, of course, the stars in this story. In addition to my students, I've had lots of people that have helped me get to the place I am today. And the story really is about being in the right place at the right time with the right people as well. I want to take you back to 1987, when I was an undergrad at Cornell. I was reading an article in the New York Times, and I read about a technology that can take wastewater, treat it anaerobically, and produce valued crops, such as roses and plants and woody grasses. And lo and behold, the author of this, of this article and this technology was a professor at Cornell University, where I was a student. His name was Bill Jewell. 
I looked up Dr. Jewell, and I wanted to find out what classes he taught. And I begged him to get into his graduate class on agricultural waste management. He let me into that class as an undergrad, and I went on to work with him on a number of different projects around anaerobic digestion and creation of methane fuel out of waste. So Dr. Jewell was one of my first mentors and gave me the opportunity to do research. And I eventually I ended up working for his company, Microgen. And that company developed a technology to transform solid waste into methane gas and compost. And that technology soon moved to UC Davis, where it was demonstrated under the, under the guise of Professor George Tamanagloss. And that brought me to UC Davis in 1990. It also gave me my first chance at stardom, where I featured on the cover of Biocycle magazine and had my first article published in that journal. So that was 1990, and I began my career at UC Davis as a grad student. And around 1992, I met Jeannie Darby. Jeannie became my mentor and my, fa and my faculty advisor for my PhD at UC Davis. And we started on a project looking at UV disinfection, helped out by George, of course, of wastewater and the impact of particles on disinfection. Jeannie and I worked together for a number of years and published a number of papers. And in 1996, I was awarded the Trojan Technologies Doctoral Research Fellowship for my research. Soon after that, I graduated, and I was looking for a job, and I ended up finding a, a position at the University of North Carolina initially. And the first conference I went to as a professor was at the University of Houston, and it was a symposium in honor of Jim Simons and the DBP research he had been doing. And at that symposium, I met a number of people who would be key in my career. The first of those was Jim Malley. He's a professor at University of New Hampshire. Jim was literally the lone wolf speaking about UB technology and how it could be applied to water treatment at the time. I met up with Jim, we took some long walks at that conference, and I really understood what it took to be a professor uh, thanks to his guidance. And he set me on a path of research and inquiry that I haven't stopped from. The other person I met at that conference was Phil Singer. Now, sadly, we lost Phil earlier this year. Phil was my academic great-grandfather. So my advisor, Jeannie, her advisor, Des Lawler, was advised by Phil Singer. And Phil came up to me at that conference, that same conference in Houston, and introduced himself as such. And I said, what's an academic great-grandfather? And so he went through the explanation. And it was great to meet Phil. He really helped me out in my career, especially being in North Carolina. We met often, um, and he took me under his wing and helped me so much throughout uh, the years. In 1998, the UV technology really started to take off, and I was in a great position starting out a new faculty position, having worked on UV under my graduate career. And I met with Jennifer Clancy at a conference, a disinfection conference in 1998, and she was just working on disinfection of cryptosporidium with UV light. Jennifer and I became friends and worked together on a number of occasions. That year, I also met Alex Mafidi. Alex worked at Metropolitan Water District of Southern California. We actually never met in person. We met over the internet. And through my first internet connection, we developed a proposal to the Water Research Foundation, which was then the AWWA Research Foundation. And we got funded my first research grant, which was AWARF 2668. And I was off to the races. So when you think about UV technology, the tipping point I see it in water treatment is really around 1998. We had the outbreak of cryptosporidium in Milwaukee back in 1993, and the EPA was looking for technologies that can treat cryptosporidium effectively, especially for unfiltered water utilities such as New York City, Seattle, and Boston that were feeling stress around cryptosporidium. So Jen Clancy and her team discovered that UV disinfection was very effective against cryptosporidium, and they published a number of papers and reports on this fact. And at this time, I also started my position at UNC Charlotte, and UV was getting a lot of interest in the research community. So our goal as environmental engineers is public health protection. And we need to ask the question, can UV treatment help? And certainly given our modern water quality concerns, thinking about inactivation of pathogens, protecting public health from waterborne diseases, removal of chemical pollutants, such as inorganic and organic contaminants, and then thinking about maintaining favorable aesthetics, we have to think about how does UV technology fit into this paradigm, and how can we have the result of appropriate and effective and safe water treatment technologies? So what is an ideal water treatment process? When I think of an ideal water treatment process, I think of a process that would have no synthetic or harmful chemicals, that will be free of unwanted byproducts, that will be free of unwanted residuals, using sustainable materials, 
using low or little to no energy, be very fast acting, be easy to operate, and be autonomous. So there's some natural drivers for UV applications and disinfection. Think about wastewater disinfection. It makes a lot of sense to use UV. The water's gonna go right into a receiving body, to a, a river, to an ocean. No need to put in chlorine and then dechlorinate that water. UV works very well for wastewater and it makes a lot of sense. In systems that don't use chlorine as well, we wanna have an added protection and UV could be that protection. UV is not a chemical, so there's no byproducts, such as chlorinated disinfection byproducts. And as we know now, back in 1998, it was discovered that UV was very effective for cryptosporidium and giardia. And for unfiltered systems, such as those systems I mentioned before, it could be a very, very important technology to meet regulations. And of course, UV is seen as a green technology, using no chemicals, working at the speed of light. It's got a lot of interesting uh, scientific potential. But we're in the 21st century now, and it's not so easy to get technology accepted. Well, I think of things as good stuff and bad stuff. You want the good stuff. You want basic research to support that technology. You want validation procedures. You want safety factors that are in place. You want sensors and automation. You need to have the, the technology validated and certified. You need to have mathematical models to describe the technology, obviously. But we want to also minimize the bad things. We don't, we don't want to have a lot of residuals forming. We want to make sure we're not forming a lot of byproducts. We don't want any harmful side effects. We don't want any toxic materials or dangerous handling. And our goal as environmental engineers here is to require the good things and minimize the bad things. So looking back at the work I've done with my students and colleagues, this is kind of the roadmap that has unfolded over the past 20 years of our research. The idea came up initially, we need to develop standards and protocols to really benchmark technology and to allow fair comparisons between different studies in the literature. Literature is, is riddled with, with, um, with papers that aren't really effective because they don't use standardized processes and procedures. So we want to standardize the UV technology approach and the research approach to UV. We also obviously want to generate fundamental and applied evidence to support technology acceptance and adoption. This includes understanding UV mechanisms and tailoring innovations based on that knowledge. Of course, we seek to leverage other opportunities once we have UV established, and we did do this, looking at advanced oxidation processes, treating recalcitrant pollutants, and thinking about applications in water reuse. And lastly, we want to imagine what the future might be and work toward that future, such as working on UV LEDs, thinking about small systems, thinking about meeting the needs of the global population for safe water. So let's look at this and go through a few of these ideas that kind of shaped my career and helped map out our research over the last 20 years or so. The first is standards and protocols. One of the first things I did as a new professor was thinking about how can we standardize UV research in the lab? First of all, to get my students to do the same things over and over again and to make sure other people are following the similar procedures so we can compare systems across different labs. I wrote a paper with Professor Jim Bolton, who was one of my early mentors in UV, and we decided to put a paper together that would standardize the methods for doing bench scale experiments with UV disinfection. This paper was published in about 2003, and last I checked, it had over 650 citations. We then worked on standardizing procedures for polychromatic UV light, multiple wavelengths, how do we measure those, which ones are germicidal, what techniques can we use. Then we went on to look at photoreactivation processes and how we can standardize that information so that we can compare different studies between each other. We began to rethink the early work we had back in 2003, how we, can we update things and provide a new approach to thinking about bench scale research. And most recently, we put out some standardized uh, processes and procedures for looking at UV LEDs and doing research with UV LEDs. So these kind of set the standard for bench research and for researchers in academia. But we also worked on protocols for the world in general. As the EPA developed new regulations around the enhanced surface water treatment rule, the availability of UV disinfection for disinfecting cryptosporidium was a key component of that rule and a key driver to allow that rule to move forward. So the EPA recognized that UV was a fairly new technology and needed to develop documents to help standardize practice and bridge the knowledge gap. So we worked on uh, this approach with a number of consulting utilities and also the EPA to develop UV dose tables, validation protocols, monitoring requirements, and eventually the UV disinfection guidance manual in the mid-2000s. This guidance manual took over six years to develop and included methods for microbial determinations, included validation examples, 
looked at issues such as lamp breakage, and defined validation protocols. In addition to the EPA document, we also work with the NWRI to develop UV disinfection guidance for drinking water and water reuse systems. So now that the EPA had a guidance manual, we needed a place to validate UV disinfection systems, and these were not small systems. Places like New York City wanted to put in UV disinfection, and they had large, large reactor systems that at minimum were about 40 million gallons per day. There was a UV validation center developed in upstate New York that took over an old wastewater treatment plant, and it's shown here, is operated by HDR and Hydroqual. And this is a, a spot where many water utilities and many consulting engineers brought UV systems and manufacturers got their systems validated uh, to prove their performance. There was so much interest in this process and so much backup in, in validation of these systems that a second facility was built in Portland, Oregon that was run by Corolla engineers. All these efforts resulted in applications such as New York City's largest UV disinfection system in the world treating two billion gallons per day. I had the opportunity to serve as a technical advisor to New York City on developments of their UV treatment system, which allowed much of their flow to remain unfiltered. And being from New York, this is a real treat for me to participate in this project and see it come to fruition. And it helped protect my mom and other family members as well from cryptosporidium in New York. All this activity around UV catalyzed a lot of funding that we were able to take advantage of. Thinking about funding, we worked on projects such as fundamentals of pathogen and activation, looking at modeling hydraulics and UV systems, developing new methods for validation, examining byproducts, and examining new UV technologies and evaluating those for verification. The next area I want to talk about is looking at fundamentals and applied science and thinking about the work we've done understanding UV mechanisms. Thinking about mechanisms of inactivation, thinking about wavelengths and the impact on UV action spectra, which wavelengths are most important for disinfection, and how we utilize tools in molecular biology to understand the fundamentals of the disinfection processes. So how does UV actually work? Well, the photons contain a lot of energy, and the photons are preferentially absorbed by the nucleic acids such as RNA and DNA in an organism. And this absorbed energy causes bonds to break between adjacent strands on nucleic acids. And these, when these bonds break, they form damage sites, and this inhibits the organism from replicating. And if an organism can't replicate, it can't cause an infection. And the wavelengths that are most important here are in the UVC range, as you see here in this diagram in the bottom. The peak effectiveness of UV light for disinfection turns out to be the peak absorbance of, that, of those photons by nucleic acids, which is around 260 nanometers. Now, since all organisms have nucleic acids, all of them are susceptible to UV disinfection. So UV doesn't care if you're a bacteria, a virus, or a protozoa. It will act in the same way, and the photons will enter the cell or the organism and be absorbed by the nucleic acids, that DNA and that genomic material, and cause disinfection. The typical UV lamps are low-pressure mercury vapor lamps and medium-pressure mercury vapor lamps. The low-pressure lamps shown here emit mainly at 254 nanometers, and the medium pressure lamps have a polychromatic output. Now remember this polychromatic output because we'll talk about it in a few minutes. These are the standard lamps, and they're similar to fluorescent lamps that you might have in your house or in your, in your office, except they're much higher power, and in the case of medium pressure, they emit at multiple wavelengths. So what do UV systems look like? Typical UV systems for wastewater are at the top, a low pressure UV system, they're glowing green, and a medium pressure UV system on the right. And then for drinking water, we see on the bottom, we see an advanced oxidation system, and we see a medium pressure system on the bottom right. These are what UV systems look like. They're very small, typically. They're typically in line with pipe systems. And the, the contact time for UV light and water is usually under one second, which is very fast compared to other treatment technologies. So UV is effective against all pathogens. Uh, it's just a matter of what dose you can deliver. Now typically, the dose we think about for UV disinfection of drinking water is around 40 millijoules per centimeter squared, shown in this orange line on this plot. As you can see, at 40 millijoules per centimeter squared, an activation of many organisms is possible for over four log reduction. This includes bacteria on the left-hand side, a number of viruses in the middle, and cryptosporidium and giardia, which we talked about earlier. So a dose of 40 is very typical for disinfection. But there's one organism that always stood out that caused us a lot of headaches and wondering why it's so resistant. And this is adenovirus. 
you see here the dose for four log inactivation of adenovirus is over 180 millijoules per centimeter squared, which is much different from any other organism we'd come across to date. As part of different projects, we were looking at different types of UV technology and how it could perform against different types of pathogens. And one of the technologies we looked at was medium pressure UV. And under the guidance of a project with, UV, with um, the UV guru, Jim Malley, we found out that medium pressure UV was actually much more effective for inactivating adenovirus than the low pressure UV. So the single wavelength of 254 is not very effective, but the multiple wavelengths of this polychromatic system were very effective. In fact, it dropped the dose by almost a quarter. So we had to ask the question, why would medium pressure UV be so much more effective than low pressure UV? So we developed a project with the National Institute of Standards and Technology using their UV laser system to really look at specific wavelengths and how effective they were for disinfection for various organisms, including adenoviruses. So we used the UV laser system to generate wavelengths around 210 nanometers, 220 nanometers, 230 nanometers, and up and up and up, up to about 300 nanometers, and study the inactivation efficiency of each of these wavelengths. We developed what's called action spectra to try to find out more about why medium pressure was so much more effective for an organism like adenovirus. So we developed an action spectra for adenovirus, and we found that low wavelengths below 240 nanometers were between five and 20 times greater at killing adenovirus than the UV254 emitted by the low pressure lamp. This is a really interesting finding because it's opened up a lot of questions, such as why were these wavelengths more effective? Why is medium pressure uh, wavelengths more effective? Can you combine different wavelengths to cause an enhanced effect? So this research really opened up a lot of avenues for research. In fact, we started asking these questions, such as what are the mechanisms of UV disinfection? How is the genome, such as the DNA and RNA, affected compared to the proteins? If you look at this plot on the right here, you see that the peak absorbance of DNA is around 260 nanometers, but proteins have different peaks between 280 and also below about 220 nanometers. And this is interesting because proteins are important also in causing infections for viruses, and if we can damage those proteins, there may be an impacts for disinfection performance. So for the genomes, we're interested in damaging wavelengths around 260 nanometers, plus or minus. And for proteins, we're really interested in looking at these lower wavelengths and perhaps upper wavelengths around 280 nanometers. And you can see this picture of an adenovirus here, all the fiber proteins and the hexon and the penton proteins, these are all proteins that guide the virus to the host. And if we could damage these proteins, especially the fiber proteins, we can perhaps stop attachment and stop infection. And this might be one of the mechanisms that caused enhanced inactivation of adenoviruses that we found with the medium pressure light. So we're looking at advancing UV technologies and what can we do to try to tailor different wavelengths, leveraging the fundamental knowledge that we had developed. So what if we could actually design our own UV emission profile? It would include wavelengths that proved effective. It would not emit wavelengths that we did not want. It could be operated for specific microorganism disinfection, perhaps, and maybe it could even take advantage of other specific water treatment objectives, such as contaminant degradation and oxidation. So we took this approach to looking at UV LEDs because UV LEDs were just emerging and coming out in specific wavelength um, packages that we can then apply to understand the effectiveness of UV disinfection. So looking at UV LEDs, we have UV LEDs that emit at 260 nanometers, 280 nanometers, and think about those two and which, which types of an organism we're trying to target. So the 280 nanometers could target the proteins, and the 260 could target the nucleic acids. If we can combine these, perhaps we can have a more effective UV disinfection treatment system using these LEDs. This work was done by my student, Sarah Beck, but we were really curious about 222, because this was the wavelength that was most effective for adenovirus disinfection and virus disinfection in general when we looked at action spectra of these different organisms. But there's no UV wavelengths available at this level based on UV LED technology, but we did explore Exemer lamp technology to generate this type of knowledge and to understand how we can effectively use UV technology for enhanced disinfection with multiple wavelength sources. So we looked at a number of different UV LEDs at 255, 265, 285, as well as the 222 nanometer, and tried to combine these to affect disinfection that could be more effective than perhaps even medium pressure UV that we found with the viruses. The results are that tailored wavelengths can have an important impact on UV disinfection. In fact, we found that 222 nanometers was the most effective wavelength for virus disinfection, and that it has some benefits 
over typical UV disinfection systems. And we, when we combined 222 with the LEDs, we found even more enhancements when we did them in sequence. Now, when we used 260 and 280 together, they did not exhibit any synergy, but they worked very, very effectively as expected. At this point, I want to take a quick break and think about UV disinfection over the last 30 years, specifically the metrics around UV disinfection citations. I did a search on the web of science and putting the topics UV and water treatment and disinfection and looked at the number of papers over the last 30 years that have been published. There have been about 3,700 3, papers published and tens of thousands of citations to those papers. Looking at over the years of the citation index, one can see the citations starting very low in 1990 and getting up to about 14,000 by 2019. And this is quite fortuitous for my career because in 1993 was the year I first published my first paper. And at that point, there were 13 citations to papers that had the topics of UV, water treatment, and disinfection combined. It's like investing early in the stock market, putting out a paper in 1993, because the number of citations have went up exponentially since then. So let's look at other opportunities here for UV. In addition to disinfection, we also want to ask, what can UV do for other types of contaminants? So my group has had an extensive history of UV-based advanced oxidation research as well as disinfection, but that will have to be a talk for another day. But just real quick, we've been working on issues around UV hydrogen peroxide advanced oxidation, UV chlorine advanced oxidation, and UV nitrate advanced oxidation. And of course, the goal here is to destroy contaminants and render them harmless for water. But now I want to move on to the last topic of my talk. It's looking at imagining the future with UV disinfection and UV treatment technologies. I want to think about UV LEDs for small systems. I want to think about UV applications beyond the treatment plant. Think about UV disinfection for the underserved populations across the globe. And then talk for a minute about UV applications to fight the coronavirus pandemic that we're currently experiencing. First, UV applications for small systems. Now, UV LEDs have a number of attributes that really make sense for small system applications. They've got small footprints. They're very sturdy to use. They're operable intermittently. They're autonomous in their operation. They have a long life. They have no mercury residuals, no harmful residuals that are produced. They disinfect well and produce minimal disinfection byproducts. They have low power requirements, and they are also compatible with photovoltaics. We were part of the de-risk center run by Scott Summers here at the University of Colorado for a number of years. And my student Natalie Hull and Will Harold worked on a project where we installed a UV LED system in a small town outside of Boulder called Jamestown. We ran this project for over a year, and they went up weekly and bi-weekly to collect data on the system. We used a UV disinfection system called the Pearl Aqua. It was a small LED system that emitted at 282 nanometers, and it was installed here at the treatment plant. You can see in the picture on the right. It's a very small system, about six inches in height. We ran the system for a year, and it was resilient over the full year of continuous operation. It worked under adverse conditions, such as no maintenance, near freezing, and runoff conditions in the stream nearby. So we didn't actually touch the system once, we just let it run on its own. And the proof of concept proved that it worked very well. Jamestown has a flow of about 50 liters per minute overall, and we treated about 1% of that flow. And the cost for the full year to treat that flow with UV disinfection was less than $25. Also, the performance was maintained equal to that of, of the parallel chlorination system throughout the whole year. So clearly, UV disinfection and UV LED technology can be very appropriate for small systems all across the globe. Then we want to think a little bit more outside of the treatment plant. What can UV do outside of the plant, specifically in the water distribution network? So we had a chance to collaborate with Paul Westerhoff, who was last year's Clark Prize laureate. And we worked to co-edit a special issue of Accounts of Chemical Research, where we got to vision kind of the future of water treatment. So I worked with Vanessa Spite and Natalie Hull to vision UV for the future and think about a roadmap of sorts that we might follow for research that we might carry on. And one of these areas is looking at UV disinfection applications in distribution systems. So think about UV in transmission mains, think about UV applications in storage tanks to reduce biofilm formations, think about UV applications in pipe networks, think about UV in point of entry and point of use systems. You can imagine with now with UV LED technology and this really small scale treatment technology and these small lamps, we can really embed UV systems in all types of applications. 
And when we think about the current state of our water distribution system and the need for rehabilitation, it's really an ideal time to start rethinking how we might envision the distribution system of the future. There's over 93% of the folks in the US that receive water with a secondary disinfectant, but in many countries around the world, secondary disinfectant is not used, and UV disinfection could be an effective technology to help protect those public water systems. The precedent for secondary disinfectant free water has definitely already been set, and we need to ask the question, can we do better and make water safer using and integrating UV technology? When you think about UV, it's actually all around us already. Conventional UV sources are used to disinfect many different areas of our lives, including water, our toothbrushes, our spaces, our surfaces, and UV LEDs are embedded in many applications, such as your water out of your refrigerator or a coffee maker or in a water bottle. So UV disinfection and applications can be thought of as spreading throughout all types of facets of life. And just imagine the magic of UV everywhere. UV is definitely a proven technology for disinfection. It's definitely got immediate applications as far as the technology goes, in point of view systems and point of entry systems in buildings and in people's homes. There's definitely immediate applications for systems that don't use any residual. Over the next 10 to 20 years, I definitely see distributed applications of UV increasing for water security applications. There's an opportunity to install new pipes with embedded UV LEDs and associated sensors to make sure those systems are working. And think about UV robots that might probe disinfection systems and distribution systems to maintain them and reduce biofilm formation. Of course, we need to work closely with regulators to overcome regulatory reform issues, but we've done this before with UV applications and drinking water treatment, and it can be done again. Back in 2007, I really thought broadly about water treatment and my role as a researcher, and I wrote an editorial called Water Treatment Revolution. This is an editorial in the Journal of Environmental Engineering where I was an associate editor. And in it, I tried to think about an effort to modernize our water treatment system, thinking largely about issues in our current system. Thinking about globalization, for instance, there's so many approaches out there that are effective for water treatment. We can take a much more holistic approach to our water treatment technologies, thinking about multiple barrier applications, moving away from patchwork processes, and integrating more biological processes into our water treatment, stabilizing our water rather than just treating it for the problems it has, minimizing chemicals and residuals, and leveraging, of course, UV technologies. Then I wanted to ask the question is why is so much energy and money spent on accommodating chlorine, minimizing DBPs, minimizing issues around taste and odor, versus just rethinking its use and maybe integrating it with other technologies or perhaps replacing it with something like UV technology. When I think about these issues, I think also about public health protection worldwide. We've been working for a number of years in different countries around the world. And a lot of these countries use hand pumps and community piped water systems for their water supply. And there's definitely a huge need to sustain and protect water quality and water systems in these areas. When you think about the UN Sustainable Development Goals, indicated here in the bottom left, SDG number six says that we should attain safe drinking water for all across the globe by 2030. That's gonna be a big challenge. But we can't just take our technologies that we have today and just implement them all over the world and expect they're gonna work. In fact, the use of chlorine in many places is not culturally appropriate, and taste and odor of chlorine is not very appealing to many people. So we need to think about new solutions, and one of those solutions might be UV disinfection. Thinking about the tap stands that many communities use for collecting water, bringing it back to their homes, and the hand pumps that they use that are fed off groundwater sources, We've been working to sustain these systems and figure out what it takes to maintain them, to keep them operating. But the second question you have to ask is, what is the water quality in these systems? And are we doing a good job at treating the water before people use it? And in fact, many of the systems we work with have contamination of E. coli. And we can take care of this E. coli. Imagine if we can take care of this through applications of UV disinfection in these hand pumps, in these piped water systems. Some technology that would be invisible to the user, but would help protect public health and improve the water quality for those who use that water. Imagine if we had UV LED technology back in the 1800s when we had the Broad Street pump incident and the outbreak of cholera. These are applications that UV is ready for, and UV can make a big difference in public health protection. So looking back at this question of what is an ideal water treatment process, I think of it again as one that has no synthetic or harmful chemicals, that's free of unwanted byproducts, free of unwanted residuals, uses sustainable materials, uses low to no energy, is fast acting, 
it's easy to operate, and is also autonomous. When you think about UV technology, it meets many of these requirements, and I think UV is an excellent technology for use in many different applications around the world. The last thing I want to leave you with is applications of UV to control respiratory viruses, such as the coronaviruses that we're dealing with in this COVID-19 pandemic. There's many ways you can think about controlling viruses in air, and there's many great technologies out there using UV light to treat that, whether it's upper room germicidal inactivation, or an air duct and air handling system, or UV wand to disinfect surfaces. There's also UV robots that go into hospital rooms that are used in transportation systems in the evenings, such as trains and buses. And then we're even envisioning using UV light in public spaces, especially the UV-222 technology I talked about earlier, looking at eczema light sources. I had a chance recently to talk about UV applications in air and to fight the coronavirus pandemic with Bill Nye, the science guy. I was on his podcast invited to talk about UV technologies on his coronavirus edition a couple of weeks ago. I encourage you to take a look at that, listen to that episode and learn a little bit more about how UV can be used to fight the coronavirus pandemic. Well, thank you so much for your attention. I really appreciate being able to, to share with you some of the research we've been doing around UV light, talk to you about some of our ideas for the future. And I really wanna thank a number of people, a number of, of folks for, that helped me throughout my career. Of course, my family. I wanna thank my family a great deal for sharing me with all of you over the years. My students, of course, the pictures of whom you saw earlier. There's many a thesis and dissertation embedded in all this work that we're doing, and they've been doing an amazing job. The funding agencies I've had a chance to work with, the National Science Foundation, to the Water Reuse Association, the Water Environment Federation, NWRI, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. They've been great at funding our research and taking a chance on us when we had some crazy ideas and wanted to pursue them. And of course, I want to thank my incredible colleagues who've inspired me, my academic colleagues, the utility folks I've worked with who keep me grounded, the consulting engineers who keep me working on great projects, and of course, industry folks who keep the innovations coming. Thank you very much for your attention. I want everyone to stay safe, and I know I'll see you soon. Thank you, Carl, for the insight into your work, its implications and impacts. We especially appreciate the reminder that our work is a story about people and about a strong community premised on service to our fellow citizens. On behalf of the board and staff of the National General Water Research Institute, I wanna thank you for tuning in today. Your participation here validates our efforts all year long to create new healthy sources of water. I wanna say thank you to the Clark Prize Executive Committee and 2003 Clark Prize Laureate George Chabonagloss for his dedication to the integrity of the Clark Prize selection process. His equanimity and experience make this work truly enjoyable. Thanks are also in order for 2014 Clark Laureate David Sedlak and Water UCI Director David Feldman for challenging me to think creatively about the Clark Prize event and encouraging me to find new ways to deliver this important content. NWI relies on its research partners at the National Water Research Reuse Association, and with special thanks to the California, Colorado, and Orange County chapters of Water Reuse. I also want to thank AMTA, IUVA, and AESP. We are humbled by their support and their collaborative spirit. We are grateful that the NWI community also includes a many generous corporate sponsors, contrib contributions that are big and small, and all that are essential to NWR's success. I especially thank Trussell Technologies, Corolla Engineers, Black and Beach, CDM Smith and Biolago for their support of NWRI during my tenure as, tenure as its executive director. And to each of the staff who helped develop the six member agency videos, thank you for making our vision a reality. I want to wish all of our service members, both active duty and retired, a peaceful Veterans Day and remind you that I look forward to seeing you all, whether in person or by digital means once again, at the Clark Prize Award Ceremony in 2021.